much. Oh. Thank you, everybody. And I'm here to talk about a little bit about what everybody's here, which is the hemp industry and investment in the hemp industry. Our company, Boulder Botanicals, was actually a previous nutraceuticals company founded in 2012. And we stepped into the hemp industry and started doing research and development and formed Boulder Botanicals in 2015. Boulder Botanicals is actually a seed to shelf operation. And what that means is we've actually invested in every aspect of the vertical. So we, from agricultural to actually manufacturing, whether it's white label or private branding, we own the entire operation from start to finish. And we've invested a considerable sum of money in that vertical, in that, uh, vertical verticals. Um, and I want to take you through it a little bit today so you have an understanding of some of the trials, tribulations, and challenges, and I can pass on some information of an industry that I believe is actually bigger than the industry that we're, we're sitting in, which is the marijuana industry. The hemp industry, or investing in the hemp industry, is probably one of the best opportunities I've seen as an investment banker in my whole life. You have an industry that is predicted to be $22 billion by 2020. That's a 40 times growth from today. That's bigger than marijuana. And there are many aspects to the product which is fueling this growth. Not only can you take it medicinally as in CBD or other CBA or all the panels that we've heard before with all the different products and cannabinoid profiles, but you have a product that is completely 100% usable. It's waste usable. It can be put into polymers, chemicals, fabrics, has many aspects. A $22 billion industry Domestically, there is not enough biomass to actually feed all of that material. And I just made this thing go backwards. Man. There we go. So if you look at the chart of comparison right now, as it relates to how many acres are being grown, in Colorado alone, we saw from last year 200 farmers to 1,000 registered farmers for agricultural hemp in the state of Colorado. That's pretty impressive growth in one year. The industry is continuing to expand, and there is not enough material of quality that can be utilized in the industry. If you look at what we're doing now with the history of hemp, it has been pretty much an illegal product. The Farm Act, the 2018 Farm Act, is changing that, and we see it on our side in orders where we've seen over 10x growth year over year. Right now, Currently, for this quarter, we have seen sales exceed for next year of over 114 million just with our operation alone, tier one and tier two suppliers. We've cultivated 70 acres of materials. Next year, we're bringing up to 350 acres. We own an 1,800 acre facility, and we keep expanding our farming operations over and over again to try and fill that demand. So as a capital investor, these markets We've never seen, even if you look back at the internet or you look at any other operation um, or growth, whether it was automotive, whether it was technical, whether it was internet, each one of those markets expanded to a certain point and then, as we all say, the bubble collapsed. For this to actually reach a bubble, if you look at those numbers, it would take a sizable event for that to collapse. So as a capital investor, this is an excellent market. It's still in its infancy. It's not even close to a bubble. And the sheer amount of growth alone will carry any type of investment capital for considerable time. When you look at the growing of the material, it's very important if you're going to step into the hemp market to understand how the product is grown, understand the trials and tribulations that relate to the product. The product will absorb everything in the soil. You've got to make sure you test that soil. You've got to make sure that you, you bring in an experienced agricultural team. This is an agriculture product. It is very different than marijuana. It is grown at a density of anywhere from 1,700 to 2,000 plants per acre, and it is all done in large scale. Many operations do not have the capability to process this material, so you have to make sure that you put that infrastructure or make a partnership with that infrastructure so you can process that material to a sellable product, whether you're going to go into fabric manufacturing, if you're going to polymers, or in our case, if you're going to use medicinal materials. Um, it's very, very important when you're looking at hemp investments to understand testing, 
just I can't get it critical enough. We see so much biomass in our facility where the material has, has been absorbed. It's full of pesticides, it's full of metals, it's full of all sorts of contaminants that we cannot utilize because we're making consumable products. Very, very important that from, from your initial soil testing all the way through, testing throughout the material and all the way to the extraction component, and whatever extraction that you do do or, or utilize or joint venture with, you have a solid understanding of who they are and that they can produce material that can be sold. We've seen material, we've seen extractors actually come to the table with so much ethanol, it actually didn't clear the federal limits, which is a lot of ethanol, 3,000 parts per. We've seen material that is filled with contaminants, filled with heptanes. Again, understand your process, line up your process, meet all your vendors, and get a exit point that you are comfortable with before you actually put one seed in the ground. It's also important, too, when you're looking at growing in this material, investing in any type of agricultural, that you understand what your output is. Where are you going to go with the product? Are you going to go for industrial hemp, or are you going to go for a medicinal product, something that can be utilized for consumables? All of this should be pre-planned before you make any capital investment. Understand what your output is going to be. This is, a, <laughs> thank you. this is a different type of investment, this is a different type of component, this is a different type of industry, a different type of marketplace. It is so fast, so fast growing, it will get away from you. Trust me, I've made every mistake known to man, which is why I, I'm up here. I've grown hemp, I've made mistakes, I've had the product completely unusable, I've processed the material the wrong way, I've processed the material the right way. I'm speaking from a lot of experience. It's very important when you look at hemp to bring in a team that can have some experience. There are a lot of consultants out there that say they have experience. Make sure you do the research and you get involved with someone who actually has done it in the past. Also, your agricultural team, we usually look for at least three to four harvests before we ever employ any part of our agricultural team. So they understand how to grow it, they understand all the issues as it relates to hemp. Everything from the pests to the, if you're gonna harvest the material by hand and you're gonna put it in the field, guess what, you're gonna have birds attack that hemp at the end of the day, every single day. Figure that out. You're also gonna have to figure out your loss factors. Guys, I'm here to tell you that start figuring if you're gonna invest in hemp and you're gonna grow hemp, you're looking at about a 30% loss factor. No way about it. There's 30% of that material is going to be thrown out. It's either going to be males that are pulled, if you're growing from seed, it's going to be material that doesn't root, it's going to be a whole host of agricultural problems that you're going to have. So when you're doing your math and your capital investments, make sure you figure that out. Quality. The most important thing, as in any other agricultural product, is quality. It is so important, again, to make sure that the material that you're growing has value. You're making a capital investment, and you're in a marketplace where values really are all over the map. You can sit here, and I can, I can tell you this year at Harvest alone, I've seen material as low as $10 a pound, as high as $75 a pound of harvest. How do you make an investment with that kind of spread? Well, you have to go back to QA. You have to make sure you have quality assurance all the way through. You have to make sure that that material that you're going to provide is going to be the best material possible for the exit value that you're looking for. Quality assurance is something that the industry lacks overall, and if you're going to make a capital investment, it will lead you to be top tier when you're growing your material, when you're exiting that product. Quality assurance is something that is in every business, but for some reason, in the hemp industry, because it's grown so fast, it's kind of gone to the wayside. These are important attributes, especially when you're selling any form of commodity or product. So if you look at the industry, you want to make sure you have the right agricultural team. It's an agricultural product, lots of mass. It's not marijuana. You're going to grow tons of material, not pounds. When you're looking at equipment and you're going to make that capital investment, remember, this material is very different. It will destroy a combine, guys. One harvest will take a combine. That material is gone. If you're looking at 
excuse me, if you're looking to grow in the material and you're going to harvest the material, what's your harvest plan? Are you going to harvest by hand? You're going to harvest by combine. If you're going to combine the biomass through a combine, if you are going to go that route, you're going to reduce the overall percentage of CBD, which is really what's driving the price of the material at the moment, because you're going to blend it with all the other materials. So if you have a 16% CBD profile, let's just say, which at this moment is right around three to four dollars per percent of CBD profile, and you're going to run it through a combine, basically you're grinding up all the other biomass inside that material. So what that does is it reduces your price per pound. You're going to have to figure that in. If you're going to hand harvest, you're going to have to add labor to it. We hand harvest our material at a density of about 1,700 to 2,000 plants per acre. That's a lot of material and a lot of humans. We then hand process the material because our material is actually going for consumable products. We're trying to maximize value. All of this has to be thought through and planned. When you come down to extraction, there are many extraction methods. Again, I highly recommend understanding where you're going to go with the product, what you're going to do with it, and what extraction method you're going to utilize. You hear a lot of people up here talk about isolate, talk about distillate, talk about all different components as it relates to the final ingredients just for, for this side of the industry. Forget about industrial for a second. Each one of those extraction processes ends up with a different result. If you're going to try and produce material and you want to have an isolated molecule, there are certain processes for extraction that will not work effectively and others that are much more effective. If you're going to grow distillate, if you're going to go for distillate and just make an oil or a base oil, it's a different extraction process. From the extraction process, then it has to be gone through winterization, decarboxylation, any of these components, again, you have to have a relationship with if you're going to join venture or if you're just going to sell the biomass outright, you should have that plan in place so you know who your eggs are to. I also highly recommend you do not do joint ventures with your biomass if you're making that capital investment unless you know your joint venture partner thoroughly. Why? I've had trucks of hemp sitting on the side of the road because my joint venture partner didn't come and pick up his biomass. Think about that. You have a biomass, it's a plant, and it's going to start degrading by the minute. Every single 30 days, your profiles are changing, your peroxides are increasing, that biomass is degrading, and it's becoming less and less valuable. And we're not talking a few hundred pounds, we're talking tractor trailers. 300 pound totes, which are worth a lot of money, that you can end up in a really bad situation if you don't thoroughly check out who you're doing business with. Again, it's a gold rush. There's a lot of people in the industry, a lot of people looking to make a lot of money as fast as they can, and there's unscrupulous characters anywhere. It doesn't really matter what industry you're in. So make sure you do your homework. Make sure you do your research. Make sure you align yourself with leaders in the industry. And they're out there. There's some really good companies, good partners, and great relationships. If you're going to go the route of actually starting to do some of the extraction of material on your own farm and make that capital investment, please, again, bring someone in who's an expert. I've actually been at some of these shows where I've looked at a piece of equipment that's a million dollars and only does 1.5 liters per hour. For 7,500, I can, I can push 25,000. I can literally push 15, 20 liters an hour. Again, capital investments all are about research. Everybody that's coming into this industry, I highly recommend you just take the time to do your homework. You'll make a lot of money. It's an industry where there's so much room to grow. And it's probably one of the better industries you've ever been involved with in your whole life. Because I, I'm here to tell you I've been in a couple of businesses, one or two. So I'm going to open it up to questions because I feel it's probably better than just Q and A, especially if we're talking about investments. So I can give you some some uh, some better advice. What kind of return on uh, investors expected to be in this kind of What type of returns are investors looking for these days? Okay, me as an investor, I'm looking for as much money as I can make. Uh, typically, if you're looking at the agricultural component, 
On an investment, if you're doing it properly, you should be in the four to ten dollar range for production of biomass. Um, but the market value right now, depending on the material and the cultivar that you utilize, an exit value of anywhere from twenty-one to sixty dollars per pound, which is a pretty decent rate of return. I would stay away from investors that are asking for ridiculous rates of return that are just not responsive and can't be done. And that's a pretty common experience in this industry. Most people are looking for re really high returns in a short period of time that are not obtainable. Also, guys, prepare on the first investment of the first round. Start very small because you're gonna make mistakes and you don't wanna take that heavy loss. It's better to grow a little bit slower. The market's rapidly expanding and you can get in a cultivar, you can get in a harvest, and get some experience on the belt, and then expand your operation. <coughs> no investment questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can you speak Thank now you. about how to... What? Thank you. Banking. Banking is an issue. I highly recommend that you look at banks that have charters where they accept hemp. Uh, Bank of America is always a problem. Chase is always a problem. Great Western Bank allows hemp businesses. If you're in Colorado, Legacy Bank down in Southern Colorado is an agricultural bank that is involved with and accepts hemp manufacturing and growers. Um, I am investing in a uh, hemp business in Colorado. I've been in the marijuana invis uh, in business for about nine years. I've seen prices drop by over 75% of marijuana in Colorado. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned that the same thing's going to happen when the large, the millions of acres between Indiana and us start opening up to hemp. What are your thoughts about the future of hemp pricing and uh, whether or not you can get a decent return on your investment and, how, and for how long? Great question. Actually, probably one of the top concerns we have on a daily basis. The amount, sheer amount of agricultural demand is growing, but the amount of farmers that have stepped into the marketplace at this moment are far exceeding current, current demand for actual product. So there is an excess of biomass. There's also a tremendous amount of states which are now adding to their rules and regulations and laws that they can grow hemp. And we also have the 2018 Agricultural Act, U.S. Farm Bill, which will probably pass in the first quarter of this year and allow for the separation of legalization of hemp state to state, which is why Colorado just changed its Amendment X and took it off constitutional protection. So if you look at the price of biomass, it should come down. Just by sheer basic economics, you're going to see a cost reduction in the price of the biomass. And the goal is, like any other agricultural component, is to make sure you properly grow the material, harvest the material, and keep that price point as low as possible so you can always maintain a good profit margin. But as the gentleman said, there are a lot of farms coming online. The one advantage you have right now, if you're in a state like Colorado, or if you're in a state of Oregon or Nevada, there's a lot of infrastructure in place where a lot of the states that are starting to grow biomass now have no infrastructure, and they have no exit or understanding where that biomass is going to go. Just like we saw with Kentucky, where Kentucky was literally tractor trailing everything to Colorado to get processed. So there is a competitive advantage in certain states, and I would look to those states, Colorado being one of them. So uh, an early stage company in processing is going to face a great deal of upfront capital expenditure. In order to have that kind of money and still retain the type of ownership that the entrepreneur is going to want, how does an entrepreneur defend early stage evaluations without having actually produced the results from the operation they're going to set up? Or have you seen any creative ways to structure deals that enable entrepreneurs to earn back some of that equity on performance? Well, there's two ways to approach it. Typically, if you're going to set up a company that would speak to your attorney, I would set it up with some founder preferred shares. Founder preferred shares can be structured where you can maintain voting control, but give the percentages off, whether they're power pursuit or X ratio, but again, this is for your attorney. But there are strategic ways where you can create preferred shares at the initial beginning of your operation, and those preferred shares will, will enable you to maintain first voting control of the company. Also, earn back options are a pretty standardized thing in, in, in the investment community. You can look to earn your company back based on certain milestones, and those milestones should be realistic. So you actually, when you get into operation, there'd be a chunk of the company comes back. When you produce the first sale, a chunk of the money comes back. 
So again, you can start to strategically align that company to where even if you're taking early stage capital, you can, you can maintain control of the operation and also earn back shares of the operation. But again, I would talk to a securities attorney to just set that up. Uh, my question is about valuations. I think it kind of follows on what you were saying. With early stage companies, what kind of metrics are you looking at when you're evaluating a company? Like especially, you know, is it going to be based on current revenues? And you've got so many young companies versus projections. So. Ooh, tough one. So the industry, as everyone's aware, is in the news every 10 seconds. And traditionally, right now, in the United States, you're probably seeing four times to five times projected next year revenue as your base valuation. So again, it all depends on what phase of the operation we're looking at. But if the company is looking at, at starting sales and going forward, you'll see anywhere from a four to a 10 times next year's forward forecast of the top line, which I don't think will last much longer. I think a lot of these valuations are way overdone, but that's currently where you see the market trend. Thank you. Yep. I have a question about your, your, your quality slide and also your 10 to 75 dollar spread. Uh, I'm in Paul Ward, I'm in the uh, quality management business, started in aerospace, spent many years in biodiesel, and now I'm looking at the cannabis side. So in evaluating a particular company, what quality standard do you value more is an ISO uh, based in the cannabis, in the biodiesel business at BQ 9000, if you have that standard, then you're worth more. What do you see uh, in the hemp business? That's a great question. Standardization and quality assurance is all over the map as it relates to both cannabis as, as well, and even less so in, in hemp. Hemp has almost no quality assurance or background. Um, our facility, we maintain strict ISO compliance, we're a CDPHE registered facility. We're, you know, we have all of our HACCP and everything else in place. And we're constantly reviewing all of our standard operating procedures, all of our SOPs and everything to make sure that we're in compliance with our compliance officers. Many people in the industry, um, there's a huge lacking component as it relates to QA, which is why I brought that slide up. So there is a de definite starting, a definite change in the industry or a change of the wind, but it, for the most part in the hemp industry, it barely exists. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Darwin Ballard. I am uh, the Industrial Hemp Liaison for ASTM International's D37 Committee on uh, Cannabis. We're creating global standards for the cannabis industry. Um, out of curiosity, how much would international standards for the cannabis industry help mitigate risk for investors? So international standards would probably assist the entire operation of the United States dramatically. Um, again, any standardization, I believe, the industry needs, which is why I believe Colorado is probably one of the best operating standards to take a look at, even though it's only CDPHG um, that currently regulates it. But all standardization should be looked at. International standardization has been in existence for quite some time and would actually aid the industry dramatically, again, if we could get those policies and procedures put in place. We're an advocate for any form of standardization. My question to you is on the flip side of uh, being a producer or a processor. What about the retail side of it? Uh, the upside of retail is showing that that's where the growth is really coming. You know, um, in the fact that it's being made into the CBD product. And so, uh, where do you see the investment for retailers? So where do we see, so downstream all the way at the end product, where do you see the investment in downstream? In yeah, product? downstream. That would be in brand. Branding. Brand, so branding, brand. anybody with secure brand or shelf space would be the capital play there. You have a very fragmented industry from end to end. I mean, if you look at the overall industry, I believe there's only a handful of companies that are in the 20 to $30 million range, a few maybe above it, some slightly below it, and then predominantly almost everybody else is in about a million and a half to $900,000 range. We have customer after customer that walks into our facility for private label manufacturing, and almost everyone's in that, that, that range. So you have the ability to put some strategic capital into a good brand and then, and then see a good exit value on that brand. Considering that CBD is able to be shipped across the state lines. 
CBD, hemp-based products, however you want to classify them, whatever you're looking at. I'm not going to get into the label. I did a label and show off somewhere else. But yeah. My question on industrial applications, whether it's plastics, um, yarn, yarn, concrete, uh, insulation, etc. Yep. All these countless applications, but I've seen very little out there about how cost-effective it is to manufacture versus traditional materials. Yeah, what I would start to look at, if you're going to start to look for metrics on that side, I would go into the European markets, I would go overseas, where those metrics are readily available, um, and that material has been processed and worked with for quite some time, and those are good starting metrics to look at what has to be done here, and what the capital investments would be, and what the market would share, and give you good pricing ideas of what you could and couldn't do here in the United States. I have a, oh, sorry. Um, my name is Will Tarleton. Um, so, uh, from Tennessee and spend some time at legislation as well as uh, uh, sort of an advisory role to our department of ag uh, on the board of the Tennessee Hemp Industries Association. So one of the things that we're trying to uh, look at is going back to this quality assurance uh, uh, is how does uh, a nonprofit trade association um, play a more significant role advise our growers, processors, retailers on appropriate uh, standards and quality, um, and how do we play a role in such a way that can demonstrate to, say, state regulatory bodies and, um, and keeping um, us out of the hammer of too much regulation from sort of a top-down regulatory body. What standardization, we talk about ISO and, and different uh, standards like that, um, and obviously the USDA is going to be taking a bigger role uh, you know, after the Farm Bill. Um, so where is the balance between um, suggesting or promoting state policy regulation without pitching, pigeonholing ourselves and then a nonprofit trade association or some other entity uh, providing similar services of Standard, uh, standardization and quality control? For me, it would be third-party testing. I would set up a, a committee and I would get standardization for third-party testing in laboratories, start to propagate that material amongst all the labs, make sure they can be certified for testing the material because you'll see a huge variance in testing even in the state of Colorado. Laboratories really don't have good standardization at this time, so I would promote within your state testing, third-party testing. And uh, would that be maybe a, a maybe a co-op model of some sort, where you have, you know, how do you, uh, like you said, there different labs can be within varying variations. Of I, I would work with the state to try and create a base certification process and share that testing information with all the laboratories, um, because a lot of the laboratories, it's all proprietary, it's like in Colorado and in Boston and so on. The labs are already not sharing their methodologies. Um, and their processes. I believe the standardization should be made, a compliance standardization for hemp material that should be sent out across all laboratories. This way everyone can be assured of a quality assurance because I've literally seen test results from laboratories. Um, traditional, we'll do what's called a triple test where we'll take the same batch of material, we'll run three samples and we'll give three samples, the same exact samples to multiple laboratories and see the variances. We're always testing the labs as well. Right. So, I mean, that I feel is probably one of the most important components right now for the expansion of this industry is, is testing standardization, which goes back to quality assurance and QA processes. And third party testing. Sorry, I'm asking so many questions, but I had one more. Um, do you see a state that uh, has good standards for hemp or other cannabis sectors, uh, obviously with marijuana or something like that, that you think would be uh, something that the hemp industry? Personally, I'm, I moved my entire operation to Colorado. I'm, I believe in the Colorado method. I believe they've got great standards in operation, and I think they're a model that should be followed. There are tweaks that need to be done, I'm sure, but I believe that's a good base standard to start with. Thank you. Okay. Sorry we have to wrap this up, too. We're going to have a whole hour of questions. Appreciate your patience. Sorry if you didn't get yours. He's also going to be available. You have his contact info up there. Thank you so much for sharing.